And can you talk about the process of de-dollarization? Yes. And why it's in the political discourse right now? It's in the political discourse as well it should be. Uh, it should have been before because it's been going on for a while. It's not a sudden development. It's accelerating now, and particularly as a result of the war in Ukraine, which I'll explain in a minute. Basically, here's what, the way to understand it. At the end of World War II, roughly 1945, all the major capitalist economies of the world, plus the Soviet Union, were in a shambles. They had been destroyed by the war. Uh, in the case of uh, Western Europe and Russia, tens of millions of people had died, uh, factories wrecked, uh, economies wrecked. One country alone in the world came out of World War II in better shape than it went in, and that was the United States. No war was fought on our territory, with the exception of Pearl Harbor at the beginning, and then never again. And that was, in, you know, far away in Hawaii. And the United States, which had unemployment, put everybody back to work. Half the people went into the military, and the other half got jobs producing the uniforms and the guns and the planes for the military. So we went from a depression, the 1930s, into nearly full employment in the 1940s. The war put Americans back to work, built up our economy at the same time that all of our potential competitors, Germany, Japan, Britain, Western Europe, every, were destroyed. So the world in 1945 hovered around the United States. The United States had a position it had never had before in its history, never even close. It was now the king. And the U.S. dollar became the global currency. In many parts of the world, even if there was a local currency, merchants didn't want it. They wanted to be paid in dollars by their own people, and on and on and on. So the dollar took on this fantastic global importance. It was, uh, quote, as good as gold, because literally it was. It was as acceptable as a bar of gold would have been and in the way no other currency could be. It meant that all over the world, people held on to dollars. And that has to be understood for the enormous gift to the United States that entailed. Think of it this way. If we buy something real from another country, French wine, or a Japanese a made in Japan automobile, or a software program produced in Finland, or whatever it is, we pay with little green pieces of paper, dollars, that cost absolutely nothing to produce. The whole world shipped goods and services to us for our use, for our consumption, for our use to produce yet more things, and all we had to give them was a piece of paper, a cheap little green piece of paper. Even better, they didn't want to hold on to the dollar in that form because it doesn't earn you anything. So what they did was, here we go now, lend those dollars back to the United States government, getting a treasury security, which pays interest. It's a dollar object. You can convert it into dollars at a moment's notice, but it pays interest. So the government has now encouraged our politicians to borrow because the whole world is accumulating dollars. We had that situation for the whole second half of the 20th century, and it played an enormous role in the prosperity and growth this country enjoyed. No other country was in that position. The British, by the way, had had that before. The British pound had been in the 19th century what the U.S. dollar became in the 20th. Now, every country understood that. And every country was jealous of the United States because they wanted the benefit of producing little pieces of paper and expending them for real goods and services, only to have the people with the paper lend it back to their, their own government. This is a hustle that any other country would be, you know, desperate to enjoy. They've all wanted it, but they couldn't do it because no other country 
was playing the role of the United States. Now, once you understand the history, you'll understand this is not sustainable. The rest of the world isn't going to lie down and not try to replicate, to grow, and to be a competitor of the United States. Western Europe, even united in order to play that kind of role. And it began to be that the rest of the world, to a degree, not like the dollar, but to a degree, began using the euro starting in 2000. Even a little bit the Japanese yen, because the Japanese grew dramatically in the second half of the 20th century. But then the world changed. I'm, I'm exaggerating, but not by a lot. With the war in Ukraine, what folks have to understand is as horrible as the military battles are in the Ukraine with the destruction uh, of people and property that we see there, that's not the main war going on. The main war going on is economic, and it has to do with the United States doing something extraordinary. Obviously, it can't... Con directly confront Russia because that's nuclear war or the risk of it. And that, fortunately, people aren't that crazy yet. So how does the United States respond? Well, it made a choice. It's going to hit Russia with sanctions. It is going to use every e economic power it has, including the use of the dollar in the world, to go after the Russians to deny them access to their own dollar reserves. They have dollars here in the United States backing up the Russian ruble as a currency. The United States seized that. The United States denied Russia the ability to use the dollar payment system in the world. It's called the SWIFT system. It was set up years ago to allow transactions in dollars between people everywhere in the world. It's a major trading mechanism. They were frozen out of that. They were sanctioned. They were really, it was called the mother of all sanctions. It was a colossal policy failure. Why? Because the Russians, it turned out, had a plan for how to get around the sanctions. Having been sanctioned by the United States many times, in the recent past, they had plenty of experience with dealing with them, and they learned from that experience. So, for example, refusing to buy Russian oil and gas, which was a crippling attack against Russia, designed to collapse their economy because they're dependent on exports of oil and gas, what the Russians were able to do very quickly was simply sell the oil and gas somewhere else above all to India and to China. The two largest countries on earth are now energizing themselves with Russian oil and gas. That was an escape beyond anything that the West could do anything about. And the Russians have then expanded from there and large parts of the global South are now busily trading with Russia and making up for Russia for what the sanctions did against it. But along the way, every other country has seen an opportunity, which I don't think Washington foresaw. This situation allows everybody to stop depending on the dollar. And they have two reasons to do it. One, I've already mentioned, they want for themselves the benefit of having their currency work as a global currency. So they want to eat into the privilege of the U.S. dollar by advancing their own. But there was a second one which should have Americans very concerned. The United States dollar was what it was. It isn't anymore, but it was because the United States promised the world we will not abuse the position of the dollar. We will not weaponize it. We will not use it to pursue our particular foreign policy. You don't have to worry if you're a little African country or an Asian country or a Latin American country that the United States, a big, powerful, wealthy country, will use its global dollar position to get rid of one government and be, bring in another government. 
It won't abuse the politics of it. When the United States did that, demonized Russia and Putin and threw everything they had at him, they were sending an unmistakable message to everybody else in the world. Friend, foe, and in between. Watch out. The United States can't any longer manage the world the way it once did. And so it is abusing its role as the neutral caretaker for the world's currency by becoming a partisan user of its position. That's another reason, whether you're Indonesia or India or Brazil, to, to reduce your dependence on the dollar before fear at somebody, if not Biden, well, then maybe a Trump or whoever comes next is going to be using this against you. And so the dollar, which was already shrinking because of the things I said before, the shrinkage has accelerated now. So that for the first time since the end of the war, the World War II, less than half of the reserves held by central banks around the world are now in dollars, about 40%. Used to be 70, 80, 90%. It is now, and, and you see it everywhere. One of the biggest steps, the decision by Saudi Arabia a few months ago to stop doing what it had done for the United States, namely, declare that they would not accept payment for their oil. And remember, Saudi Arabia is the world's largest oil producer. They would only accept payment in dollars. That was an enormous boost to the dollar as a, because everybody who buys oil, which is more than half the countries of the world, have to get the dollars and use them to pay. Saudi Arabia changed its position, signed an agreement with China. They are now sending oil to China, accepting payment in Chinese yuan instead of the dollar. And with that kind of, it's the end. And if I could make one point, Katie, it's really important. This is part of something Americans have not yet wrapped their heads around. The American empire, like every empire before it, is now shrinking. You know, empires rise, they have a flourish, they grow, it's very impressive. And at their peak, they can't imagine that it won't last forever. It never has. Every empire, the Greek, the Roman, the Persian, the Turkish, the, you fill in the blank. They all went up, and then they went down. The ride up, much more fun than the ride down. We are now in the ride down. And we better be very careful because. Denial, which is the way most of America is so far dealing with it, is not a solution. It doesn't go away because you pretend it isn't happening. The dollar's decline is a literal barometer week in and week out of what we're seeing. The failure in Ukraine is another one. I mean, you've got to see we didn't win in Vietnam. We didn't win in Afghanistan. We didn't win in Iraq. You can dance around it 20 different ways, but it is the truth. There's not an argument about who's the good guys and the bad guys. I'm just explaining where we are not facing a decline that is underway and that is showing us its face if only we're willing to see it. And we could have a, quote, decent soft landing. Empires do not have to go out in a horrible explosion. They can decline. Britain, not that they're a model, but after trying twice to stop the United States in the War of Independence and again the War of 1812, the British figured out we can't do this militarily, and they came to terms with their decline and being replaced by the American Empire. I don't know what's coming next. I don't know whether the Chinese will be the next empire or whether it'll be handled in a multinational way. And there's some evidence in both directions. But the United States is not able to do what it did. And one of the greatest mistakes empires in the past have made is overreaching when they can't do that anymore. And my fear is we're at a very delicate point 
in that process, hampered by a denial of what's going on that periodically frightens me.